Instead of despairing, prison focused Carmen Galante's mind. He started thinking about how to stage a comeback. Jail time hardened Galante's ambition to earn money and one day lead his family. The cornerstone of his stratagem would still be heroin. Even though he was in jail, Galante made sure he kept all his old heroin contacts and supply lines. He did manage to stay involved in it, even from prison. He certainly had influence over the Bonanno family from prison. He already had established the contacts in Sicily. They were still there. The Canadian contacts were there. Then, he started to nurture an idea. To take over the running of his own family, he would need massive amounts of money. Being just one of many heroin importers wouldn't be enough. He needed to become the sole wholesale supplier of heroin into the USA. He wanted control of that spigot where he could turn it on and off and, and control the price. The colossal profits from controlling the heroin trade in America would bankroll his quest for power. So it was just a matter of what, when he got out, he was going to make sure that he controlled it all. Then, as Galante languished behind bars, out on the city's streets, events conspired to help his plan. While he was in prison, there was a rebellion within the Bonanno family, and um, it was largely over narcotics. The old leader he respected, Joe Bonanno, was forced to retire. Many of the capos, or captains that served under him, were killed or retired as well. And the Bonanos also went to war with the other Mafia families. Leaderless and in chaos, a power vacuum opened up. Eventually, in 1974, Philip Ristelli was appointed as the head of Galante's crime family. But he was under police investigation and about to be sent to prison. So, the Bananos were ripe for takeover and Galante began to concoct even bolder plans. He wouldn't just take over his own family, he wanted to take on the biggest family in New York, the Gambinos. Run by Carlo Gambino, it had become the city's toughest clan with the most profitable rackets and the deadliest killers. Galante's ambition was to crush the Gambinos and maybe one day become the head of all the Mafia, the so-called boss of bosses. His warders, meanwhile, categorized him as having a psychopathic personality disorder. In the ghettos of New York, heroin was now the drug of choice. But local law enforcement couldn't understand how the supply was growing by so much, as former detective Bill Clark explains. We really weren't hip to just the whole drug trafficking thing, where it was coming from. We didn't realize the hand that the Mafia played in it. As time went on, we realized how far behind it they were, including Carmine Galenti. Anytime there's a big pool of money around, somebody's going to try to get into it. The millions of dollars that were being made, it, it was astronomical. The number of registered addicts had boomed from 50,000 at the time of Galenti's arrest to 500,000. Politicians attempted to stem the tide, but they failed. It destroyed a lot of lives. When I first became a policeman, heroin was the drug of choice. Very few working class neighborhoods that weren't losing their sons or daughters to the heroin trafficking and to heroin use. Well, the addicts, of course, are the end products of it. And you take an addict who had an average habit of uh, one or two hundred dollars a day Think of all the stuff he has to rob and all the muggings and robberies. And that had a severe effect 
on uh, what was going on in the United States. But to exploit the growing demand and to realize his plan, now Galante had to get free. This seemed fanciful until, right in the middle of the heroin craze, his wish was granted. The man with the borderline personality disorder was paroled in 1974 for good behavior, on condition he didn't consort with known felons. After 12 years of careful plotting, the timing could not have been better. He was ready to set his plan into motion. Galante got stuck in immediately with a hectic schedule. First, he got his own house in order. Galante didn't miss a beat. When he came out of jail, he started right away. He moved to fill the leadership vacuum at the top of the Bonanno family. With Philip Ristelli starting a long jail term, Galante assumed the role of acting boss. Then, he laid down a marker. He settled any scores with rivals who had moved in on his business interests while he was in prison. He was homicidal, quite frankly. He had killed a number of people. He was feared. The other people around him were absolutely petrified of him. That made him acceptable as a leader of predators. Not simply a predator himself, but a leader of predators. He went to Miami, Dallas, Los Angeles, even Disneyland, all the time doing deals with his old associates. And Galante once again hoovered up more heroin supplies at source from the Sicilians. He had that pipeline open, and there was such an upsurge of heroin coming into the United States. The pipeline worked so well because Galante had a novel way to bring the heroin in. When Galante got out, they established a, a means of bringing in major amounts of heroin. Airliners arriving in New York throughout the 1970s often had a secret cargo in their hold. They were bringing heroin in on Alitalia flights. Every flight that left Milan, Italy, every day, a suitcase or two was put on the flight and unaccompanied. The suitcases were stuffed with pure heroin. When it landed at JFK, of course, the suitcases were marked. A mafia baggage handler would remove the marked suitcase before it even went through customs and pass it on into the network. It worked beautifully. You're talking about possibly 40 kilos of heroin coming in every day. Bringing in the drugs was one thing, but Galante needed a distribution network. So he hit upon the idea of using pizza parlors as outlets. It just so happened, this gave him a chance to strike back at his rivals, the Gambino family. The Gambino crime family had dominated the cheese and pizza industries for years. They made money by monopolizing the cost of food supplies to the pizza parlors and chasing away competition. Then, a spate of fires at pizza parlors signaled a new front in Galante's heroin campaign. As the Gambino's restaurants burned, New pizza parlors, owned by Galante, were opened up in their place. And Galante used them to distribute vast amounts of heroin to the dealers. It would just be distributed. A kilo came in, his people would distribute that pure kilo. They would sell it to the black drug dealers who were taking all the heat for this. In short time, 
Galante once again built a vast international drugs network. He dominated importation and distribution. Drug agent Frank Panessa witnessed this firsthand. The money that they were making, and not only uh, through the Northeast, he had distribution uh, throughout the United States. I dealt with people in Puerto Rico that were getting their heroin from, from Galante's people. He had achieved all this in just four years since coming out of jail. It was a ruthlessly fast rise to power, built on fear. One time, um, an FBI agent who had infiltrated the family looked in and he said, he doesn't look like much. He's an old, short guy. And the other gangsters said, look out, he's mean. They were afraid of him. And don't mess with him. At this stage, Galante was only dealing in pure heroin, and he had a particularly unpleasant way of testing its purity. He became infamous at this time for what he called the black man test. An addict would be abducted from Harlem and drugged with two bags of heroin. If he died in a set time frame, the drug was pure. But as time went on, Galante began to want even more. Galante was his own worst enemy. He was making those millions of dollars, but yet he had the greed, and he was greedy. So he would put a whack on it. He would add quinine to it, so something that was 90% heroin, he would whack it so it was 70% heroin and make even more money selling it as pure heroin. Driven by such greed, his business went from strength to strength. Everything was going well. He was making vast amounts of money and was succeeding in his ambition to become a boss in all but name. The only thing that might spoil his meteoric climb to power was either the law or jealousy from other mobsters who resented his growing dominance. In 1978, it was the law that came knocking first. Galante was arrested and charged with violating the terms of his parole and consorting with known felons. He had been spotted with other criminals, most notably at a Disneyland meeting three years earlier. It looked like he would be back behind bars, just as everything was going so well. But once again, he got away with it. Enter Galante's attorney, Roy Cohn. Cohn was a controversial figure who had started his career on many high-profile Senate committees like the McCarthy hearings. But nowadays, he represented a number of infamous mafia clients. Cohn had been charged with jewelry tampering and perjury and was now seen as too cozy with the mob. Nevertheless, he was an undisputed star when it came to getting Mafia men off the hook. Cohn was Galante's less than secret weapon to ensure he didn't do yet more time. And it worked for him. In 1978, Cohn succeeded in getting the parole violation charge overturned. And Galante became yet another success story for the mob-friendly lawyer. With law enforcement out of the way, Galante could now turn his attention to an even more pressing threat, his jealous fellow mobsters. Galante was not stupid. He knew they wanted a piece of his drugs profits, but he thought he had the perfect solution, a foolproof way to protect himself. <laughs> 